For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson urging you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter that these readout videos are based on, and to our various social media platforms, and to support our work so we can continue to bring you facts, logic, and quotations like, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, with a pedantic side note that there's no evidence that Einstein actually said it. But in the words of James Barry, if he didn't, he missed the opportunity of a lifetime. Because if he had, it would certainly apply to the climate zealots who barely staggered away from COP27, sleep-deprived and pointless, before staggering into COP15, complete with UN Apocalypse Now General Antonio Guterres telling delegates, quote, humanity has become a weapon of mass extinction, end quote. Hey kids, great to see you all here. Too bad you're alive. But no, it's not another one of their tricks where time runs backwards so that, say, Man-made greenhouse gases in the 20th century can melt glaciers in the 19th, or something like that, and nor is it in Egypt. It's in Montreal, and it's the conference to the, of the parties to the United Nations Conference on Biological Diversity. The 15th such, with Canada as host and ecological menace communist China holding the presidency. Canada's always modest and frugal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau surged into the rather dim limelight to hurl money about and burble, Canada welcomes the world, and, I don't know who wrote this, but here we go, quote, from the red sand beaches of Prince Edward Island in the Atlantic, to the snow-capped Rockies in the west, to the permafrost that covers much of the Canadian Arctic, Canada is known for our landscapes. Nature is part of who we are as Canadians, end quote. As for the $350 million he blithely added to our national debt, Quote, this funding will support the implementation of the future GBF, end quote. GBF being insider talk for, quote, an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework, end quote, which we don't even have, but if we did, it, quote, would provide a collective roadmap that will guide worldwide efforts on biodiversity conservation until 2030, end quote. Vox hyperventilated that, quote, one of the most important events for life on Earth ever is now underway. This week and next, delegates from more than 190 countries will come together in Montreal, Canada to hash out a plan to halt the decline of ecosystems, wildlife, and the life-supporting services they provide, end quote. Or, as in COP27, fail to do so. Or, gather to agree to targets without enforcement and then go away to miss them. And at CDN, we don't doubt that there's a biodiversity crisis. We just doubt the sanity of people who think that this model for tackling problems has given anyone any cause for confidence. By contrast, something that does work is economic development. Because when people are struggling to eat, you can't ask them to sacrifice even for some iconic rhinoceros, let alone for a frog. Yet people like Justin Trudeau are determined to mire much of the world in energy poverty, which means more environmental degradation. Now, according to Reuters' sustainable switch, this non-existent deal, quote, could lead to protections of almost a third of the world's land and oceans by 2030 and more sustainable agricultural systems, forestry, and fisheries. Yeah, and we could win the lottery. But in the meantime, we're not ordering that shiny new car. The New York Times climate forward is equally grandiose. They claim that, quote, world leaders are not yet done negotiating the future of the planet this year. Another crucial environmental meeting is about to start, and there is hope that the world could agree on an official plan to protect nature. At this week's UN meeting in Montreal, known as COP15, leaders will have an opportunity to change this path by setting goals for each country to work toward through the next decade and beyond. Targets could be expanding protected areas, getting rid of subsidies to industries that harm nature, or agreeing on funding strategies for conservation, end quote. So it's all could and might with no enforcement. Just like, what was that other cop-out? In the newsletter, we also suggest that the climate debate needs fewer climate scientists and more engineers, because that's a profession that specializes in trade-offs. Consider the Telegraph headline, quote, Electric car journeys could be restricted in Switzerland under plan to deal with energy shortages, end quote. It started as an online rumor with a broken link, but it's a real story. And it makes you wonder what people who think that EVs are more energy efficient than ICE, that's internal combustion engine cars, think that the phrase energy efficient means, or possibly could mean, if you have to ban them to save energy. Possibly nothing at all. In Canada, Blacklock's reporter disclosed, Our environment department decided to mandate all electric cars by 2035 before doing boring homework on whether they're cost-effective. Mind you, quote, Staff wrote in a notice to contractors, The study will highlight the key lifetime cost differences between light-duty vehicle market segments, end quote. 
not might highlight, will highlight or no grant for you, since they're planning to ban new gas and diesel cars in 13 years, though right now, just about 2% of cars, SUVs, minivans, and pickups in Canada are electric. Nor does our government have clue one about how to expand the grid sufficiently to power them all, or where to get the batteries. Boring. We have a planet to save, whether it wants it or not. When the German Chancellor came to Canada begging for liquid natural gas to alleviate its self-inflicted energy and geopolitical crisis, he was told to go jump in the Rhine and then, to add insult to injury, forced to tour a solar hydrogen plant in Justin Trudeau's imagination. But now, the Vancouver Sun just noted, quote, Germany will be buying Qatari gas into the 2040s, end quote. Whereupon Trudeau's Natural Resources Minister, Jonathan Wilkinson, told the House of Commons Natural Resources Committee that potential European customers, quote, want to see the liquid natural gas product in Europe within three years, or they're really not interested, in part because they are aggressively moving toward hydrogen, which is something that Canada is very interested in supplying to Germany, end quote. Right. So, they signed a deal with a grubby tyranny for decades worth of the stuff they don't want after three years, and they ignored their democratic allies' unworkable hydrogen that we don't have that they do want. They just don't know it yet. And hence, Britain also opened its first coal mine in 30 years while pretending that it's to smelt steel and will be net zero in its operations. Now, for people who do know it yet. The world's second largest asset manager, Vanguard, just bailed on Mark Carney's GFAN's Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative out of an abundance of desire to, quote, help provide the clarity our investors desire, end quote, about uh, throwing their assets down the green rabbit hole. As Bloomberg put it, with delicacy, quote, Vanguard indicated its decision rested in a desire to maintain the freedom not to restrict its investment options, end quote. But the harsh reality behind those soothing words is that green schemes aren't the money makers we were told, which is why it requires governments to rush in where businesses fear to tread. So, as Vanguard becomes rear guard, Canada's finance minister and deputy prime minister, Christia Freeland, is planning to spend $2 billion of public money on the shares of a non-existent company that will supposedly attract private funds to green technology. What could possibly go wrong? Freeland's investment of real money in a fake company to, one presumes, lure Vanguard back in with its seven trillion or so in assets under management to these glorious investment opportunities that only governments can see, reminds us of something out of the book Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And what it specifically reminds us of was the 1720 offer, during the frenzied South Sea bubble, of shares in, quote, a company for carrying out an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is, end quote which, like the non-Einstein quote, appears to be semi-apocryphal, we note sadly, before noting with alarm that it seems to be happening again anyway. Another approach to this unwelcome reality is to fib. Thus, The Economist declares in apparent surprise that, quote, dubious green funds are rampant in America, new research suggests Wall Street is banking on bogus claims, end quote. It seems that there has been a significant downgrading of green funds even in Europe, Quote, but new research published this week in the Review of Finance, an academic journal, suggests American firms are doing worse. When it comes to sustainable investing, Wall Street stalwarts appear to run a fully-fledged laundromat of exaggerated sales pitches and bogus claims, end quote. Well, sure they do. Remember that financial firms, like most elite institutions in the modern developed world, are filled with perky young adults whose often unexamined mental and sociological furnishings include a strong commitment to fighting climate change. Like their professors and their politicians, these young people really thought there were these hugely attractive investment opportunities in green technology all over the place because they really believed renewables were more efficient than fossil fuels and would bring all those shiny, high-tech, well-paying jobs to the future. Now the receding tide of illusion is exposing them financially and intellectually, but not as fraudsters, just as really, really badly confused. On a more positive note, where politics has not contaminated it, the true spirit of science lives on. The joy of discovery and the thrill of challenging established views. So a number of publications are gushing that, and this is NBC's version of an AP story, quote, scientists discovered the oldest known DNA and used it to reveal what life was like two million years ago in the northern tip of Greenland, end quote. 
but in their enthusiasm, they overlooked the extreme political incorrectness of the news that, quote, during the region's warm period, when average temperatures were 20 to 34 degrees Fahrenheit higher than today, the area was filled with an unusual array of plant and animal life, the researchers reported, end quote. Sorry, did you say 20 to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 12.5 to 20 degrees Celsius, higher than today's unprecedented global heating climate breakdown, and life flourished? Tipping points were not tipped? What is this heresy? Can it be science? Oh yes, the real hands-dirty kind. Quote, with animal fossils hard to come by, the researchers extracted environmental DNA, also known as eDNA, from soil samples. This is the genetic material that organisms shed into their surroundings, for example, through hair, waste, spit, or decomposing carcasses, end quote. That's pretty gross, but it's also really cool. And it gets better. Not only did they find traces of geese, hares, reindeer, and lemmings when all they'd found before was a dung beetle and some hair remains. And I was thinking of a t-shirt saying, I went to Greenland and all I got was this lousy dung beetle. But no more, because they found hairy elephants and they trumpeted with glee. Quote, I wouldn't have in a million years expected to find mastodons in northern Greenland, end quote, said one researcher. Actually, it wasn't in a million years, it was two. But remember that even in the warmest period in the 65 million years since the non-avian dinosaurs got the comet, that's the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum 55 million years ago, it wasn't 20 degrees Celsius warmer than today, or even 10. And two million years ago, the Earth had already cooled into the Pleistocene Ice Age, in which our Holocene is just a brief and comparatively cool, though nevertheless welcome, warming interval. So nature sure is naturally variable, right? Though obviously the story has to come to the opposite conclusion, and so do the researchers or their grants go extinct. Thus, the lead author, quote, believes that because these plants and animals survived during a time of dramatic climate change, their DNA could offer a genetic roadmap to help us adapt to current warming, end quote. How? By turning into mastodons? And speaking of being blown away, we continue our Everybody Knows series with climate scientist Patrick T. Brown writing a thread on Twitter discussing claims in the New York Times that, as everybody knows, climate change is making hurricanes more intense. And in the process, he exposes some very unscientific slate of hand, in which the Times looks past the declining number of hurricanes overall to the proportion that are strong hurricanes, that's category three or higher. Funnily enough, those are down too. But since the number of category one and two hurricanes has declined considerably from the period from 1979 to 1997, to the subsequent period, which is 1998 to 2017, and the pr number of strong storms has also decreased, but less, the result is that while all storms are down and strong storms are down, if a hurricane happens, the chance that it's a strong storm is slightly higher. In the Times' conclusion, climate change is making hurricanes worse. And speaking of hurricanes, call us nerds, geeks, or dorks if you like, but we would love discovering a new online data source. So here, for the enjoyment of our fellow nerds, is the Colorado State University Hurricane Records Portal, and exhibit number one is the global number of tropical cyclones since 1980. Getting worse, are they? And if you really want to startle your alarmist relatives at the holiday dinner table, check out the Accumulated Cyclone Energy Record. Accumulated Cyclone Energy, also known as ACE, measures the total energy in the storm systems. So it's essentially an index of how harmful hurricane activity is each year. For 40 years, climate alarmists have said we're all going to die, and the actual climate has yawned and gone back to sleep. You can see why we find data so much fun. So much so that we bring you a CO2Science.org archive study on, quote, the interactive effects of short-term drought and heat stress on two wheat genotypes, C.V. Galdius and Paragon, growing in pots in controlled environment greenhouses, end quote. As usual, it turns out that if bad things are happening to plants, more CO2 helps them cope with it. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I'm protecting biodiversity by cultivating my own garden.